Hello. Coming up in the next half hour. He's been an MEP for the South East since 1999. Now leading the Brexit party, he wants your vote again. Nigel Farage joins us live. Could another new political party, Change UK, win European Parliament seats in our region or will they split the pro-Remain vote? And a new path is being built around our coast, but is it safe? I'll be asking the government agency in charge of it. Joining me in the studio today are the Conservative MP for Maystone, Helen Grant, and Labour's Karen Constantine, who's a councillor on Kent County Council and has just been re-elected to Thunnet District Council. Lovely to have you both with us this Sunday Thank morning. You. Now, talking of councils, here's political editor Helen Catt with what happened in the local elections in our region on Thursday. <laughs> Blink and you'll miss it. In Medway, the rare sight of relieved Conservatives in these elections. I privately was hoping we'd get around 30, give us a working majority. to have got 33 in the current national uh, climate. With all that's going on, is I think, is nothing short of miraculous. But miracles were in very short supply elsewhere. In Folkestone and Hyde, they'd conceded defeat before a single vote was even counted. The mood of the public is, uh, is angry out there, and it's angry with Westminster and they are reflecting it on the way they vote. Just hours earlier, they'd lost Tandridge in Surrey, losing seats to Lib Dems and Independents. I think people are um, upset with the major parties and they're looking for more representation from uh, independent parties. In Oxted, some voters told us what influenced them. It was all local issues. So it was the, um, the so-called garden village, which probably is anything but, um, and just the state of the high streets and things like that. And Brexit play any part in your thought? Um, yes, yes. So I'm a bit, predominantly local. bit off the Conservatives, <laughs> like everybody else. Tandridge's Conservative leader was among those kicked out. Several others have followed in Canterbury, Tunbridge Wells and Swale, where the Tories also lost control of the council. But what about this for a contrast? After a middling performance in Medway, Labour celebrated an all-out win in Gravesham, the South East's most heavily leave voting area. Labour held Crawley too, but in Brighton and Hove they've been hard pressed by the Greens, who've had a good election across the South East. People are becoming much more aware of the importance of the environment. We've got 11 years to try and turn things round, and that is very much reflected in today's vote. Despite a good national performance, the Lib Dems didn't manage to take Maidstone or Lewis, but they kept hold of Eastbourne. My thanks go to the people of Eastbourne who have given us an unprecedented fourth term of office uh, running this, this wonderful town. Helen Catt there. Well, let's go to Helen Grant, who's in the studio with us now. What message, Helen, do you take from the election results, the local election results here in the South East? Sure. Well, we always knew these elections were going to be difficult. We, we're mid-term, nine years into power, difficult cycle. Um, they were terrible, bad, bad result. And, and I think that happened because people are completely frustrated by the fact that we have not delivered on Brexit. And I, I think this was actually evidence locally, certainly on the doorstep around Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells, and, and actually in the spoiled ballot papers. Mm. So, for example, in, in Hawkehurst and Sandhurst, there were 60 failed or soiled ballots, and in, in I, I think it was Benenden and Cranbrook, 30, when usually there would be maybe two or three, mm. and many of those spoilings were Brexit-related. Karen, same question to you. What do you take from these local election results? It's not just about Brexit, it's actually about austerity. So that's what I was hearing on the doorstep. That's what I think was reflected in our gain at Thanet District Council. Remember, we've gained 15, 15 seats on Thanet District Council. People's frustrations are with the state of the local council. They're with the lack of bin collections. They're with litter on the streets, all the usual things you would expect for a district council. So you would argue that people did vote on local issues? In, I think in they very much did. And I also think it was an anti austerity vote, I think it was an anti-conservative vote. Well, which may be the case in Thanet, but, it, but, but that's difficult to extrapolate across the country, isn't it, where Labour didn't gain seats, they lost seats overall. 
We, we, we gained more, obviously, we, we lost 71 seats, mm. but overall we did really, really well. I mean, I don't think you can compare the loss of 71 seats to the catastrophic loss that the Tories experienced. I don't think it's just about Brexit. I also okay. think it's about austerity, and people now have, are fed up of that too. Mm. Well, certainly when I was talking on, on social media with people where I am and I was asking them, look, I'm going to do the Sunday politics at the weekend. Was this all about Brexit? They said, no, in Tunbridge Wells, we voted on the new theatre. We voted on the hub in Southborough. So there were areas where local issues did come to the fore. Let, let's go back to the doorstep. Helen Grant, what were people saying to you about Theresa May? There is much talk this morning about how long she lasts. Daniel Hannan in The Telegraph this morning, who's running as a candidate mm. for your party in the South East, said this. If MPs don't remove Mrs May immediately, that is this side of the European elections, there will be no Conservative Party to inherit. Is he right? Well, I, I think, just going back to the doorstep point, it was about local issues, and, and that's why we did you know, quite well in Maidstone. We, you, you know, we didn't lose, we mm. didn't win, we, we held. Um, but, but I think it's more that people are generally frustrated and fed up with Westminster politics, but, but let, West, it, ra yeah. rather than one per person. W w w so and, in which case I you're saying Daniel Hannan is wrong, Theresa May isn't the problem and she should remain... I, I'm saying that people are fed up with what we are doing. We were sent to Westminster mm. to make decisions, make tough decisions and deliver. Yeah. And unfortunately, we have not delivered Brexit. And, and that is an annoyance. And I think we all okay. actually have but, to take some responsibility for but, that. But you retweeted David Davis's support for former Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab to be part Party leader and PM. Why do you think he's the right person? Clearly, you are thinking beyond Theresa May. Well, I, I mean, there's no vacancy at, at this minute, but uh, certainly there is a lot of talent in the Conservative Party. Uh, Dominic Raab is one of those that could do extremely well, but you know, there are other people too. Uh, Karen, Brexit, you want another referendum on any deal. Interestingly, John McDonnell said on the Ma programme just before us, we may well have to have a public vote on any Brexit deal, which may be comfort to you. Isn't there a sense that resolving Brexit as quickly as possible, you know, a deal between the Conservatives and Labour in the next week, perhaps, would just enable you to move on? You've talked about austerity, you've talked about the local issues. This would enable you to move on. Why do we want another referendum? Well, I think it's unlikely that we're going to get a deal between the two parties. I think, going back to Theresa May, I think the time has come for Theresa May to step down. I think she has lost the confidence of not only her own party, but very many people in the country, and that's playing into this idea that politics is a mess. We don't want our politics to be a mess. We want okay. proper democracy in place. Let me just ask Helen a quick question on, on Brexit. A deal could be done between Labour and the government this week. There's lots of talk about it, even about what might be in it. It might save you from getting a kicking in the South East European Parliament elections, not least to the Brexit Party, and we're speaking to its leader, Nigel Farage, in just a moment. Mm. Is that important? What, to, to find a solution and leave the EU? To say, and to say, well, yeah, but, but crucially, to stop you getting that kicking in the South. You don't want another kicking I, like I, you had last week, I, I think the priority, without any shadow of a doubt, is to deliver on that referendum result. That is the focus. That's what we are trying to do. Um, if these uh, discussions between um, uh, uh, Theresa May mm. and Jeremy Corbyn work, then then good. But we'll have to see. I don't think we should preempt. We, we'll just have to see what well, comes Brexit's out. It's already been a disaster for people, hasn't we? We've seen jobs losses, we've seen the Bank of England report, we've seen the greatest rise in, in poverty that we've experienced for a very long Can time. I just we're, we're on that we will come back to it, I, I promise yeah. we will come back to it, but as I promised, we're going to go on to Nigel Farage, who was first elected to the European Parliament for the South East in 1999. He's running again this time, this time as leader of the Brexit Party. He joins us now from Westrom in West Kent. Nigel Farage, thank you very much for your time. Good morning to you. Good morning. You've said that you've come out of semi-retirement to lead this party. You've been an MP for the South East for 20 years on a decent salary we estimate of £90,000 recently. Um, did you really treat those 20 years and that salary as semi-retirement? Uh, no, what I said was I was leader of a national party before, so rather than working 40 hours a week, I used to work 100 hours a week, uh, and for the last couple of years I've taken it a bit easier. Um, I'd fully intended to leave the European Parliament. I'd done my 20 years because I was told by Theresa May 108 times that we were leaving on the 29th of March. That's what the country were told. We haven't left on the 29th of March. We're now told we, we could be leaving by the 31st of October. Frankly, I don't trust this government 
or this Parliament to give us anything like the Brexit that people voted for once in a referendum, twice, of course, in a general election when various promises were made. And that's why I've set the Brexit Party up uh, to fight for democracy. You know, what kind of country are we if we have the biggest democratic exercise in our history and it's not delivered. I want it delivered. Theresa May has said we've got to do a deal. A lot of talk in the, today's newspapers about a deal possibly being done next week between Labour and the government. Um, if there is a deal between Labour and the Conservatives, that means no European Parliament elections, or, or at the very least you probably wouldn't be able to take your seats, no chance possibly of that big triumph for you and your new party. Let me just tell you something. If that deal is done between Corbyn and May, which means a permanent customs union and effectively staying part of the single market, that will be the ultimate betrayal of all the promises that were made to voters. And I promise you, millions of voters would leave both the Conservative and Labour parties in that eventuality. If this deal goes ahead, there will not be a Conservative party uh, that, that, frankly, even existing. And I think we could be very close now to politics realigning in this country. What does the vote for your party, the Brexit party, achieve? Is it just about sending a message to the other parties, um, especially the government? Is that it? No, we want to change politics for good. For us, May the 23rd is the first step uh, to a much more radical kind of politics than I've ever been involved in before. We have got to break the two-party system. They serve nobody but themselves anymore. Uh, we have an electoral system that's out of date, a House of Lords that is discredited, a Parliament no longer in touch with the people of this country, um, and we've seen a betrayal of that referendum result. So, no, we want a radical transformation of British politics to make it directly accountable, to make it reflect who we are, and winning those European elections is a very good first step. Well, help us out here and tell us a little bit about what your party believes in. It might be easy for you, as it, as it looks perhaps from the polls, to win the European parliamentary elections on this single issue of the Brexit you say the people voted for. But there's no manifesto. There are no policy statements on a wide range of issues. If you run in for Westminster, which everyone's now sensing and you've talked about putting candidates up, what is your party about except Brexit? Well, well, let's be clear that this is not just another issue. This is about whether we are a democratic nation. It's about how the rest of the world sees us. And we will fight the European elections on democracy and trust. Beyond that, of course, we'll have a broad range of policies. But by the way, I will never use the word manifesto again in my life. Uh, the word manifesto has a word association with lies because both the Labour and Conservative parties told us in 2017 they would deliver the Brexit we voted for and they're not doing it. So I will call it in future a policy platform. OK, but I mean, if you, unless you have one and you clearly don't at the moment, how can you possibly held, be held accountable? What do people think they're going to be voting no, no, for? No, no, no. We are... Well, if we're not a democratic country, you may as well close Parliament down and not bother with elections. Just, just have us run by Mr Juncker and a few bureaucrats. This is the most important question we've asked ourselves in this country for 300 years. That is what May the 23rd is all about. Beyond that, we will talk about health, education and everything else. Um, you talk about whether or not we're a democratic country. Some might question whether yours is a really democratic party. UKIP's number one candidate in the South East, your old colleague Piers Walkup, said on this programme last week, Nigel Farage left UKIP because he wanted to be in complete control. He set up a party surrounded entirely by people selected by him. Is he right? Well, I'm running this new party like a company, um, and it's so far, we're four and a half weeks into our existence, we're topping the polls at 30%. I think we're getting it right. You're running to be MEP for the South East again, but you're doing very well in the polls for the European yeah. elections. You spoke this morning on Sky of the prospect of a political realignment, and you've talked about it again on this programme. With the Tory party, as you see it, no longer fit yeah. for purpose, is this Nigel Farage who wants to be Prime Minister? Uh, it's Nigel Farage that wants to radically change British politics. I've never had those kind of political ambitions. I'm not like sort of a Boris that dreamt from Oxford of being the PM. What I think I'm good at is, is making arguments and shifting the debate in the country. I think without my efforts, I, to be honest, I doubt we've had a referendum. And I now want to try and use uh, you know, whatever I'm good at to try and reshape British politics. I've no ambition myself to finish up at the top of it. But if I can be an agent for change, an agent for democracy, I'd be very happy to do that. Nigel Farage, thank you for joining us.
From new parties to a new path. A 2,700 mile footpath is being built around the entire coastline of England. It is a rambler's dream, but in the Isle of Sheppey, the plans are causing anger and frustration for local farmers. To explain, here's Shelley Phelps. Offering stunning views across the Thames estuary and some of Kent's best bird watching spots, a coastal path around the Isle of Sheppey would be a boost for walkers, but come at a cost for some landowners. Cliff erosion is a major problem for Swanley Farm at East Church. Yeah, well, you can see how crumbly it all is. It's, its owner has safety concerns after being told a four metre wide trail will run through her land. The path's coming round our neighbour's property, coming over here via a bridge, and pretty much this is where the footpath's going to be. It's then going to proceed diagonally across to the cliff edge from where we're standing across our crops. The council have spent years telling people to stay away from the cliff, they've closed footpaths to the, breed, the cliff, sorry, and it's just not safe. And uh, Natural England are just putting people's lives at risk. There's no compensation for landowners, but the principles governing the project state that the aim must be to strike a fair balance between property interests and the public's right to enjoyment. Natural England is the government body overseeing the England Coastal Pathway. They say it will be a big boost for local businesses by attracting more visitors. And they also say it will bring people closer to nature. Here in Sheppey, they're consulting on the plans and say that the concerns of everyone will be listened to before a final decision is made. A 3,000 acre wilderness of grassland, mudflats and salt marsh. Elmley is the UK's only independently owned nature reserve. Off down the bank. And the proposed path will go through the edge of the land here too. I think largely here, uh, on a subjective side, you know, we're OK because we've used an existing path. We've already got signage in, there'll be a little bit more signage. And, and it's sort of warden, we've got volunteers and things that people are going to look out. I guess in, uh, further on through the island, there's areas where there's no access at all at the moment. It's quite sensitive, salt marsh and whatnot. And introducing people there will create disturbance. There's no two ways about it, it's going to happen. The local MP has been raising residents' concerns with ministers. They are small-scale owners for whom the businesses they run on their land are their only source of income. These are little people who feel they are up against an overbearing, mighty, all-powerful state. Once Natural England has published their proposals for a stretch in a coastal access report, there will be an eight-week period for owners and occupiers to object to, Kent has one of the biggest yeah, rambling associations, with over 4,000 members and 13 local groups, including this one in Seven Oaks. They're looking forward to better coastal access. Next, um... Oh, there are so many benefits. I mean, it's just being near the sea and the views and um, being in, out in the open, no, wonderful. Absolutely fantastic. I've walked the southwest coastal path, probably 75% of it, and I absolutely love it. I love coastal walking. The coastal path is due to be completed next year, but landowners say they won't be walking away from the fight to change the government's mind. Shelley Phelps with our report. Well, joining us now is James Seymour, South East Area Manager for Natural England. That's the government agency responsible for this coastal path. James, we saw Susan Goodwin in Shelley's film there, raising concerns that Natural England's preferred route, and I know it's not decided yet, is just too close to the cliff edge at Sheppey. How do you respond to that and the, and the issue, obviously, of danger? Well, it's a great opportunity for the coastal access to improve things, actually. Currently, there's no option for people to move the path when it falls into the sea through natural coastal erosion. Whereas after the coastal path is established, there's opportunities for that to be well managed as a national trail, but also there's provision for it to roll back as natural processes take their toll. Which means rolling back further and further into someone's land, doesn't but it? Again, that would be a process of that opportunity for us to work with landowners, and that's really important to understand, that we are working with landowners and stakeholders in this establishment of this route and that's really important to get it right at the beginning and that's why we are taking our time mm -hmm. and that's why around Kent we've already opened some routes and we worked with landowners and stakeholders to find solutions and in most cases we find those solutions and we implement those solutions with at those. Elmley Nature Reserve they are experts at looking yeah. after wildlife but they say they are concerned it will be disturbed perhaps elsewhere on the island. How do you balance that potential threat or disruption to wildlife with the public's right to access yeah. the coast. Well, naturally, has a wide role, and I was out at Elmley actually on Friday, and you know, we, that's a good example where we've really come up with some solutions with Elmley, with the owner there, to come up with where the route will lie, so that 
people have the opportunity to really experience that wildlife. Bringing people close to wildlife is really important for us. You know, there's huge benefits for mental well-being, for health, gender, to so bringing people closer to wildlife, but doing it properly. So as a body with responsibility for wildlife, we will make sure that happens in a way that supports those interest features and sometimes avoid them. So again, we've got the opportunity mm. to avoid sensitive areas and route the path in various places. What about this argument that it was supposed to be a coastal path? There was no talk of estuaries. Well, we have choices around how we ensure that we create the, the longest route um, in the world around us, linear route once established in England. Yes, 70% of the coastline's already got good access. And what we're trying to do is join it up to make it a coherent route that people can enjoy and link up between areas, both locally, so people can use it locally, but also to bring new interest into an area. And there's great opportunities for local communities to build economic regeneration around the route. And there's good evidence where elsewhere in the country where there's well-rooted, mm. signed routes that can bring benefits to local communities. Gordon Henson MP says that in one instance, the path would run as close as six metres to the house of one family. There's got to be priv privacy concerns about that. Again, you know, there's particular areas which are excluded from us to consider, such as gardens and those aspects. So you know, we, we have written into the way we operate as Natural England, we've come up with a recommendation. And the first stage is to talk to all stakeholders. So right at the beginning, um, the Sheppey route, we, were to, we opened up, we had drop-in centre sent, set sessions with locals, with parish councils, and then we started talking specifically to the landowners and people interested in the route itself. Let's bring out in two other Kent voices on this very subject. Helen Grant, we heard from your Conservative colleague in Shelley's report, Gordon Henderson. He opposes the plans and says that these people, his constituents, are up against the overbearing might of the all-powerful state. How should the government respond? Well, personally, I mean, I, I love it, actually. I, I think it's, it's a great plan. It, it's, it's good to encourage walking. It's good for health. It's good for tourism. It's good for the local economies. Clearly, um, people need to be safe. And I was concerned about, you know, uh, routes going too near cliff edges. That needs to be dealt with. And, you know, we would not want landowners to suffer. Should they be compensated? Well, I think it's about common sense and compromise at the end of the day. That's what will get this through. And, and I know that there's a very restrictive uh, and, and, and uh, clear statutory consultation period. And if that consultation happens in the right way, mm. then hopefully the, there will be solutions found uh, which will negate having to pay damages for by way of compensation to landlords that aren't happy but it's compromise and common sense. Karen Constantine quick thought about this about whether the government's got a role here to step in and compensate how the rest of this should play out. I think it's a, a great idea I, I wasn't really uh, fully certain of the, the scale of the ambition but I think it's absolutely fabulous. I think the two key benefits, the benefits mm. to health, shouldn't be underestimated. Inactivity costs the NHS billions and billions of pounds, that's one thing. And the second thing is a real opportunity to build business around that coastal mm. path is a really key one for lots, for lots, of, lots of areas. So I, I really welcome it. I think the one thing that we do need to think about is access to public transport to mm. make sure people can get to these places walk as far as they want to walk, looking at all yeah. abilities, and actually then get, get back. Okay. So the more of this we can do, the better, I think. Okay. Karen, thank you very much indeed. James, thank you for joining us on that one. Now, the Brexit party isn't the only new party fighting the European parliamentary elections. The new pro-Remain party, Change UK, are also standing. In Westminster, they've got 11 MPs who defected to them from Labour and the Conservatives. Here in our region, one of the most senior politicians who's defected to them after 16 years as a councillor and 27 years as a member of the Labour Party is a former leader of Brighton & Hove City Council. He's Warren Morgan and he joins us now. Warren Morgan, lovely to have you with us. Your party didn't run candidates in the local elections. The Lib Dems did and uh, they, as another pro-Remain party, had a pretty good night in our region and elsewhere. For instance, they retained Eastbourne Council. How did you feel seeing them do well? Well, obviously the Lib Dems are pro-Remain, but they've been pro-Remain for a long time. And given that the polls now show that some 55 to 60 percent of people are pro-Remain, the question should be why have they not coalesced around the Lib Dems uh, to a greater extent? Now, Change UK brings together people from the Lib Dems, from the Conservatives, from Labour like myself. But 40 percent of, of uh, people in the party are, are people from outside of politics. In fact, 60 percent of the candidates on the, the list with me are people... Uh, 
had as an ambassador, former UK ambassador, someone from the media, a former nurse, a former army officer. So we're drawing in people from across the spectrum, political spectrum, and from without this political spectrum to, to really bring forward a united front for Remain. OK. It is obvious to everybody on the outside that you are all an, in danger of splitting the Remain vote at the European elections. Isn't that your focus, if that really matters, if Remain is, is so, so important to you? Well, under the system of elections used for the European elections, it's not possible to have an alliance, a pact, or any second preferences. So we had no choice but to go out there and to give the broadest possible appeal to Remain voters who, for whatever reason, can't vote for the Lib Dems because of the coalition, for the Greens as a single issue party, and obviously for Labour, where you've seen Jeremy Corbyn very clearly in the last few days say that he is pro doing a, a deal on Brexit with Theresa May this week. We've seen a lot of people leave the Labour party cutting up their cards tony robinson the most high profile please in the don't last quote of him days. it was quite rude <laughs> no i won't <laughs> <laughs> what he said about the leadership when you left labor in february you said the independent group is a blank sheet of paper some would say it still is um what can change uk say to people who vote lib dem and green out of conviction or identification with policies for example if, if you want more done about climate change or recycling you might vote green what do you think Change UK is for people at this or any other election? And it's a very similar point that I was making to Nigel Farage about single issue politics. Well, we can build a party that has a much broader appeal than, than any of the current parties. And, and we've heard earlier on that, that Labour and the Conservatives are on the verge of, of breaking up and, and they, they've lost vote share this week. We will build our policies through the summer with a series of policy events. We're not governed by ideology like Labour and the Conservatives are. We're not a single issue party like the Greens or the Brexit party. We will bring an evidence-based approach to policy, not an ideological one. And that's attracting an awful lot of people, Gavin Esler in London, is one of the people that's joined us to to create a new kind of politics our politics is broken and we do need a way through it and that's not just Brexit but that's the most urgent issue you've worked with the Greens on, on local councils do you really think it's fair to call them a single issue party uh, that does tend to to influence pretty much everything that they do uh, they weren't a, an easy party to work with through my uh, 16 years as a councillor um, so you know we, we're looking much broadly than that but we do have uh, there's another environmental mm -hmm. lawyer who's one of the change UK candidates alongside me so that is a very important policy and only by remaining in Europe can we effectively address the climate emergency that we have you voted with Labour in your last weeks as an independent councillor in Brighton and Hove and you said that you wouldn't want to run against Labour friends in a council election and you didn't stand again lots of people might say your heart is still Labour is it uh, sadly it's not uh, it was a huge part of my life for 27 years but Change UK, um, I, I felt so positive. I was so positive at the launch event. Mm. Uh, it, there is such a, a great feeling behind it uh, and, and a really positive approach to politics, okay. uh, to fixing our broken politics. And I'm really glad uh, and very proud to be uh, number three on the list for the South East. We've almost no time left, about 45 seconds left in the programme. What do you two, as representatives of what people consider the main parties, Karen Constantine in one sentence, what do you think of the new parties that you've heard from this morning? I think it's ridiculous to say Labour Party is broken. I think it's ridiculous to say we're on the verge of separating. I think you need to, to take your anger and fire it very firmly at the Conservative Party. And a final thought to Helen Grant, what you've heard this morning. And I just parties. feel we should all be focusing on honouring the referendum, which was clear, decisive, the people have spoken, coming together and leaving the EU. It was anything but clear, the referendum. <laughs> we are never going to get these two to agree on that. Warren, <laughs> lovely to see you this morning. <laughs> Helen and Karen, thank you both very much indeed for coming in. That's all we've got time for this week. My thanks, of course, to all today's guests. We're back next Sunday, so until then, enjoy your weekend. Thanks for watching.